So for me, it was kind of liberating that once you're in ketosis, you're not that hungry. And then in the context of elevated ketones, they're sort of anti-catabolic. And I talked about that a little bit. And it was it was it liberated me from food. But when I I like to enjoy food, I think food should be. I don't think we should deprive ourselves of food. So depriving myself of carbohydrates, that's not something that I miss. So, and if people really miss that and enjoy that, I don't think they should eliminate it from their menu or their meals. Like uh, I think we need to enjoy food. That that's part of the process. But I enjoy food much more. If I'm a little bit hungry, I appreciate the food. I enjoy it. Ketogenic food is like indulgent to me because for years that's the stuff I avoided. So I'm still I'm more happy with my food now than I ever was. I think, and I don't I don't have like irrational food behavior. This is episode number 120 of Pursuing Health, featuring Dr. Don D'Agostino. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Julie Fouché, family medicine resident and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring to you information and inspiration from experts and everyday individuals for how to use lifestyle to maximize health. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to Pursuing Health. I'm sure that if you're living in the world today, you probably have heard about the keto diet if you haven't tried it yourself, but this is a topic I've touched on briefly in other episodes, and in this episode, I finally had the opportunity to sit down with one of the leading researchers on nutritional ketosis, Dr. Dom D'Agostino, and we got into all of the nitty gritty details. A little bit of background about Dom before we get started. He is a PhD assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of South Florida's Morsani College of Medicine. He's also a senior research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. And the findings from his research on nutritional ketosis have been utilized by Navy SEALs as well as NASA, and he recently has been at the forefront of research on nutritional ketosis as a treatment for cancer alongside people like Professor Thomas Seafried, who I interviewed earlier on episode 97 of the podcast. I had the opportunity to sit down with Dom at the recent 2019 CrossFit Health Conference in Madison, Wisconsin, where he was presenting on some of the emerging applications of nutritional ketosis. So we talked all about the basics of the ketogenic diet, how it can fit into the everyday person's lifestyle, and some of the exciting new research that he's working on right now. Before we get started, this is a reminder that although I am now officially a doctor, this podcast is meant to share the experiences of individuals and does not provide medical advice. So with that, we'll get started with episode number 120 of Pursuing Health featuring Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm very excited to be here with Dr. Dom D'Agostino. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for your fantastic talk today at the CrossFit Health Conference. Very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe we could just start off with what brought you to the CrossFit Health Conference and what were your initial thoughts? I think this was your first, you said, first kind of big experience in the Mm -hmm. CrossFit community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really inspired by the level of engagement and interest in this topic because mm-hmm. I didn't know. I mean, my understanding is that most of the CrossFit athletes kind of use a higher carb approach, mm-hmm. so I didn't know of uh, I didn't know what I was getting into. So that's yeah. why I asked that initial question in the beginning, like how many people were high carb versus low carb. Um, and I connected with uh, Greg Glassman years ago go a few years ago and we had brunch together I think and I was amazed at his uh, knowledge and comprehension of the literature including cancer and actually some of the stuff that we published Mm -hmm. and uh, so I had a very enlightening engaging conversation with him and I know he knows my colleague Thomas Seyfried from Boston College and he had been a speaker in the past Uh, so I'm inspired that he is really pushing sort of the, this knowledge and uh, and kind of this this health movement within CrossFit. And I think uh, he's, it's, I'm inspired to see him giving back to the community like that, like creating this educational sort of outreach to the community. 
and really, um, you know, uh, expanding their knowledge so they could be better practitioners and engage with their clients and, and new people coming into CrossFit too, I think we'll be inspired by that. It is. It's, yeah. a, it's an exciting <laughs> time for sure. And I think like we were talking about earlier, we love to see it continue to grow year, mm-hmm. year after year. Yeah. So, so I want to talk a little bit about your background and, and what sort of your initial interests were and then what influenced you to become a research scientist. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was not a very good student actually <laughs> in high school. I was, uh, I grew up working on a farm, like okay. hunting, fishing, riding dirt bikes, ATVs, that sort of thing. That's and where was this at? In, in New, Jersey, New Jersey, central okay. New Jersey, uh, not too far outside of like Princeton, New Jersey. It was called Allentown okay. or Cream Ridge would be the name of the town. It's kind of not, no town. It's just like a farming community mm-hmm. kind of. And, uh, and then I, I became interested in improving my own health and performance mostly for football during my senior year. Okay. And that I was a poor, like a C student. And then I got motivated to improve myself performance and strength. Mm-hmm. And I was motivated enough to take like an honors level bio course. And I went from like C student to like an A student in like honors during my senior year. Wow. And it was completely motivated really just a self selfish motivation to, you know, I knew you could dissect a cat in honors bio too. Yeah. And I think I took it for that and I just became totally, I was reading muscle and fitness at the time. Uh-huh. And then I would actually dig up the references that, you know, a mm-hmm. particular thing would be. And it just, it snowballed. I was working out. Arnold Schwarzenegger was my idol. Yes. And it was like, I would watch Pumping Iron and Commando and all these things. <laughs> so I think I became, you know, very engaged in in powerlifting and, and football at the time got me into lifting weights, I think. Mm-hmm. And my brother did. So, and that got me more interested in using nutrition as a lever as a tool uh, to improve my performance and size and strength. And I saw that uh, of all the variables that were interesting to me, there was all these different training programs, but I, I looked at nutrition as being the main thing that could really guide my strength mm-hmm. and, and gain. So uh, I majored in nutrition at Rutgers University and then uh, was thinking forward, like what I wanted to do. And I realized nutrition, nutrition, the degrees in nutrition, I really couldn't do too much. So I decided to double major in biology too, because that would look better applying to med school. Yeah. And I realized to get into med school, you know, it was very competitive and I needed research to do that. Mm-hmm. So I did research in a respiratory neurobiology lab and I studied the neural control of autonomic regulation. So how the brain controls respiration uh-huh. and heart rate. And that was very interesting to me and I decided to uh, not go the med school route, but my PhD advisor talked me into doing a PhD in neuroscience at the time. And the 90s was the decade of the brain. So, and it kind of fit my personality, more of an Mm -hmm. introvert kind of thing. And uh, and she really talked up, you know, the the program and everything. And we we had a pretty good uh, chair for our program. Mm -hmm. So I started into neurobiology and I studied what, the brain, what happens to the brain under low levels of oxygen and how it adapts. And I was looking at, you know, lactate and glucose metabolism, but mostly manipulating oxygen. And at the time I started diving and doing more advanced diving certifications. So that led me into uh, looking at diving physiology and what the Navy was doing. And that led me to a postdoctoral fellowship to basically understand oxygen toxicity seizures, which mm-hmm. limit Navy SEAL diving operations. Okay. So I delved into a research project, which was developing hyperbaric atomic force microscopy, kind of an ambitious project. And the Department of Defense was crazy enough to basically fund uh, an equipment grant and a postdoctoral fellowship on basically using hyperbaric atomic force microscopy, which didn't even exist. So we would have to build the tool to actually do the research that they're funding me. So it was basically studying cells and figuring out what was happening at the level of the mitochondria uh, from a fundamental level and what caused oxygen toxicity seizures. Mm -hmm. Can we prevent it? Can we mitigate this from being a problem to create a super soldier scenario underwater to make them sort of as a countermeasure Mm -hmm. against this extreme environment? So 
uh, I spent about 10 years doing that, and then that led me to ketones. Uh, I looked at different drugs, and then a metabolic intervention supplying ketones really uh, was very promising. So it turned me wow. on that path. Yeah, that's so interesting talking about your path because I think when I look, when people ask me how did I go into medicine, mm -hmm. AP Biology in high school was like yeah. the one class mm -hmm. that really I think really turned me on to be fascinated by how the body works and biochemistry yeah. and um and then the other thing that you mentioned oh and then doing research in college for med school like I did that too like all good pre meds do but. For me, it yeah. was very much the opposite effect where yeah. I said, no, I don't really want to keep doing research forever. Yeah. I want to be doing medicine. So it's interesting how we all kind of find our yeah. paths. It's tedious. It's not for everybody. Yeah. And I think, uh, so my mentor, when I was an undergrad, even a junior at the time, she sent me to San Francisco to experimental biology. And I thought that was so cool. Like I had my poster and I presented it. I was like, wow, this is what scientists do. And mm -hmm. then they mingle. And I was like, well, I, I could and she this, seemed yeah. well off i mean not you don't make much of the research scientist you live grant to grant mm -hmm. so that was kind of scary but i was never really into like money or anything mm -hmm. like it i just felt you know i would be happy doing this if yeah. i could have the intellectual independence to pursue my own ideas and develop that into a research grant and discover things it was very exciting to me very cool yeah so you eventually found your way to studying ketosis and nutritional mm -hmm. ketosis can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of stumbled upon that and then how that has blossomed as your one of your big areas of research. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, at the time, I think it was about 2007, I had connected with some people on an online like nutrition mm -hmm. forum. Uh, it's more like a bodybuilding nutrition kind of forum. Mm -hmm. And Mike Dancer was his name. And I'm still okay. very good friends with him. And he had what they call terminal epilepsy. And because of my neuroscience background, mm -hmm. you know, he was asking me questions about GABA and how to, you know, drugs and things like that that he was on. And I was researching to help him and discovered that the ketogenic diet was what is a standard of care when drugs fail. It was for drug refractory or drug resistant mm -hmm. epilepsy. And I was funded to study a seizure disorder, oxygen toxicity caused seizures. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, wow, for my love of nutrition, maybe I can incorporate the ketogenic diet into my current research program I have now, yeah. which was looking at different antioxidant drugs and anticonvulsants to prevent these seizures. So I was like, wow, I could get back into nutrition. So, uh, the science behind it was very, very good. And that was very surprising to me <laughs> that it was basically one of the most powerful anti-seizure yeah. therapies that were out there. It was just so hard to implement. And Johns Hopkins, they were doing it the best. So I connected with them. And uh, and then my friend had started the ketogenic diet. And then I got busy you know, with my, my fellowship and everything. And we didn't talk for about three or four months. And then he contacted me and said, I haven't had a seizure. He was having multiple seizures a week. Wow. And then he had started it. I gave him the information, like, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. And he took it upon himself to implement it. And then it worked remarkably well for him. Mm -hmm. And then my program officer had did some work on neuropeptide Y. And I realized, oh, that goes up in the context of fasting and the ketogenic diet. Maybe if I pitched this idea of ketosis, mm -hmm. that he would fund at least the basic science research to get this into the pipeline to be used out in the field mm -hmm. for, for Navy SEAL. And he did. So uh, he came and I pitched it to him, but he didn't like the idea of a ketogenic diet because high fat diets were, you know, viewed mm -hmm. bad. They still are sort of, but he liked the idea of, of administering ketones as a nutritional agent, uh, sort of the ketogenic diet in a pill. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, investigate well whether ketones themselves can be anti-convulsant. Anti okay. And uh, we did that with ketone esters that we sort of developed and formulated and synthesized. And we tested a number of things that didn't work, but this particular ketone ester worked. And uh, that became sort of the focus. And that was about 2010 or 11. Mm -hmm. We started really doing like day-to-day -day experiments on that. And then we made some observations in, in different cell types under hyperbaric conditions. Uh, and one was a cancer cell type. And the, these particular brain cancer cells grew slower in the context of ketone supplementation. And I also saw that they were vulnerable to high levels of oxygen. So that became the PhD project 
of Dr. Angela Poff, who stayed on with me now as research associate. Mm -hmm. So she came in as a first year PhD student and she was very engaged. She's like, I want to do this project. And then it's like, I don't have funding for that project. Yeah. I had a little bit of startup funds. So I put her on that and then that blossomed into its own sort of pathway mm -hmm. studying cancer. But my roots have been working with the Office of Navy Research and developing countermeasures in extreme environments. It's so interesting how, like you mentioned when, you know, previously ketogenic diets were the standard of care for epilepsy yeah. before we had drugs. And somehow now it's only for the refractory cases. Like if you go yeah. to a doctor with a new diagnosis of epilepsy, they won't really endorse you going on that diet until you failed every single other drug. And yeah. then how you mentioned too, the desire for to to kind of put it in a pill form or to put it into something. Yeah. It's sort of our... <laughs> It's just an interesting observation of like how we're conditioned in mm -hmm. our medical system to want to have a pill for everything. Mm -hmm. And um, as opposed to kind of changing our overall lifestyle. It, it is a logistical thing mm -hmm. because it's uh, nutrition is a lifestyle mm -hmm. and getting people to change their culture if they're vegetarian or if they're you know, Indian or, or Asian, they tend to be more carbohydrate, you know, centric. Uh, and then from a logistical standpoint, from the military, you know, it could take several days to get into therapeutic levels of ketosis. Yeah. Whereas if this is going to be used operationally, you want to take it, you know, a half hour to 60 minutes before going into your mission, into your dive. So you want something that gives you neuroprotection in that underwater environment, but that also can it not impair performance. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be in a ketoacidosis. You don't want to be in a ketogenic, you know, there's narcotic effects of some right. of them. They cause GI problems. So you want to pick the optimal, you know, ketogenic strategy that works fast, has a pharmacokinetic profile of like four to eight hours during like the mission. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a lot of things, a lot of boxes that need to be checked right. for it to work. And a diet was like too right. cumbersome. And so yeah. maybe just the differences between that specific application versus yeah. like a more general population or different disease applications, which I want to get into too. Yeah, sure. But maybe just to back up for people listening, I think probably a lot of people listening have heard of keto diet before if they, they've heard of ketosis, but could you just give us and kind of break down some of these terms like you did in your talk today about what exactly is a ketogenic diet and, or what is nutritional ketosis? Is there a difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the definition of the ketogenic diet is unique in that there is a biomarker. It's the only diet that I know of mm -hmm. that when you eat the macronutrient ratios, which need to be specific that adhere to the ketogenic diet ratios, then it changes a specific biomarker that you can measure with commercially available technologies. And that's ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate. And when those ketones are elevated within a specific range for beta hydroxybutyrate 0.5 millimolar, mm -hmm. you are in a state of nutritional ketosis. And, uh, data indicates that if you get to one millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate, that can give your brain about a 10% boost in energy. Mm -hmm. So your brain uses what's available and one millimolar blood concentration represents a significant amount of usable fuel for your brain. And glucose levels really don't change all that much. So you are shifting the metabolic machinery and the fuel source of your brain. And there's advantages to that from a bioenergetic standpoint. And then from an epilepsy standpoint or seizure from a neuropharmacology standpoint, you start mm -hmm. to change the neurotransmitter systems in the brain. And that's something that we study. Um, and that became very interesting to me. So the primary thing is carbohydrate restriction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so even without the ratios and all that stuff, yeah. if you just take a regular diet, you know, you don't go too crazy on the protein, but you drop the carbs down to 50 grams per day. Mm -hmm. People that are active will get into a mild state of ketosis. If you drop your carbohydrates down to 50 or 25 grams per day, especially if they're high fiber, mm -hmm. relatively non-glycemic carbohydrates like vegetables, then the majority of people will enter a state of mild to moderate ketosis mm -hmm. where they will start getting some benefits from that. How important is it if people are, 
I mean, I guess it depends on the application, but how important is it to actually measure ketones and measure blood ketones versus urine ketones? Um, and I guess that, that kind of balance of, do you want to be in ketosis always, or is there a bad, or is there a negative implication of going in and out of ketosis? Yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, I think it's important, especially initially to just document whether you are doing it right and measuring mm -hmm. your urine ketones yeah. and they should be spilling out your urine if you're, and what we find sort of therapeutically is that when you are registering an elevation in ketones, then you start to get the therapeutic effects. So the ketones, so we don't, it's controversial now, are the therapeutic effects coming from the ketones or the physiological state associated with the insulin suppression mm -hmm that stimulates the fat burning process and reduces glycolytic, you know, activity mm -hmm. where you're getting the benefit. So that's, I believe if, because if you just give pure ketones in the context of a normal diet, you get therapeutic effects. So we know it's the ketones, mm -hmm. but it's also probably insulin suppression. And when working. you just give the ketones, does that suppress your insulin also? Uh, or no? it, so over time, if you give a really big dose, yeah. it can actually increase insulin okay. a little bit. But if you give sort of the therapeutic doses that we work with and keep ketones in like the, the two millimolar range, mm -hmm. then uh, insulin is like imperceptibly changed okay. really. Uh, and you're still, you're giving a source of calories that's mm -hmm. essentially non-glycemic, that's really not impacting insulin much. Mm -hmm. So you're still driving the fat burning process. If you give a whopping dose of a ketone ester, you could get an insulin spike, but it's pr very small relative to carbohydrates, even relative to protein okay. is pretty small. So it's a like a non-glycemic, you know, uh, source of energy that's not really impacting insulin much. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a benefit for staying fat adapted. Uh, so for the average person though, for athletes, what we see is that they are good ketone utilizers. Mm -hmm. So an athlete that engages in prolonged and prolonged would be over two hours, three or four hours. Okay. They typically have what we call, um, post-exercise ketosis. It may be mild, but their body is kind of used to going in and out of ketosis. Mm -hmm. So they are, they become good ketone utilizers. Okay. So their ketones may elevate kind of high in the beginning, but then their body clears ketones fast, especially if they're physically active. So, uh, and I've seen that in athletes that they just like can't get their ketones high, but you know, they're in ketosis. Uh, and if they're active, they particularly have low ketones, but if they are active and they remain completely sedentary and in one spot, then their ketones start to elevate because they're not moving around and using them as fuel, oh, right? So, uh, so in the lab, you could do things like a, a ketone tolerance test where you give oral ketones and then you look at that rise in the mm -hmm. fall in ketones. And if that rise goes up and they start exercising and then it goes down really fast, mm -hmm. that's a good it? ketone utilizer. But a person that's completely sedentary like a couch potato if it starts to rise and they start exercising it goes down much slower mm. so i mean the same thing with glucose, glucose right yeah, yeah I was same just thing thinking. so i think you have to kind of view it sort of in that context that if you're following the keto giant diet and doing everything but your ketones are not into that like mm -hmm. one or two millimolar range mm -hmm. but only stay in the 0.4 to 0.5 yeah. Even at 0.5, like most normal people will never get to that. Most normal people, standard diet is like 0.1, maybe 0.2 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So 0.5 is actually several fold higher. Mm -hmm. So that's still significant. That still means you're you're oxidizing fat and probably getting some benefits from that and maybe using ketones mm -hmm. very efficiently. And that's not why they're building up. It's like we wouldn't be chasing high glucose numbers. Like we shouldn't really be <laughs> necessarily right. chasing high ketone numbers. Right. But Makes sense. Yeah. So you talked about some of the physiologic impacts of nutritional ketosis relative to the brain and to energy and um, a little bit in general about metabolism. But what are what are some of the other physiologic impacts that we know of from being in that state? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bioenergetic state. Yeah, you're giving a source of fuel. And then um, an interesting thing we're looking at is... Um, the increase in uh, blood flow. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get to talk about it, but I had one student, uh, Dr. Shannon Kessel, who did her PhD with me, and she looked at the effects of ketones, exogenous ketones on wound healing. Mm -hmm. So for wound healing, we're always, you know, putting something on the wound and hoping yeah. it's going to improve it. Some, you know, this or that agent that increases some growth factor mm -hmm. or whatever. But like the wound healing society never really gave a whole lot of thought into changing systemic physiology mm -hmm. <laughs> 
to reduce, uh, you know, maybe chronic inflammation, reducing blood glucose will increase perfusion to tissues, yeah. right? So when you have a diabetic wound, the ATP concentration in that wound tissue may be reduced by 90%, mm -hmm. right? So if you lower blood glucose, you have greater perfusion of blood to that tissue. And the ketones also increase something called adenosine. Adenosine is a powerful vasodilator. If you give an injection of adenosine, mm -hmm. the person will drop down because of uh, you know low blood pressure because mm -hmm. your 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 vascular dilates. So uh, what we see using a Doppler blood flow measurement is that blood flow you know increases in the tissue with acute hyperketonemia, which using a ketone supplement, mm -hmm. and then the wound healing process is sped up too probably by a number of things, reduce reactive oxygen species, reduce inflammation, and also the increased blood flow is supplying ketones, which can actually stimulate metabolic processes in the wound tissue to enhance the wound healing. So we saw, and we have not published it yet, but it is a PhD dissertation mm -hmm. because my, my student went on to do other things. She's okay. working with the Keto Pet Sanctuary oh. and helping dogs. So wow. she's so yeah. passionate about helping <laughs> dogs. She hasn't gone back and published that. But she did amazing work basically demonstrating a very profound, even the president of the Wound Healing Society, Dr. Lisa Gould, MD, PhD, uh, said this is remarkable. Like we used her model of mm -hmm. uh, ischemic wounds. And so that's something like I never talk about, yeah. but <laughs> like I'm highlighting here is something uh, that's really important to fall back on because ketones are enhancing blood flow. Uh, you know, a, a wound is, is something like I, my sister is a nurse practitioner and deals with these uh, ischemic wounds mm. from from patients, from bed yeah. sores and things yeah. like that. And it's like billions of dollars. It's the, huge, yeah, yeah, like so. Here we have something that we're not rubbing some kind of cream on or anything. We're right. changing the patient's metabolic physiology to increase perfusion right. to the wound tissue. So and I think, think it's about something all the other is, positive side effects that that may have, like oh, in yeah, addition yeah. to the wound healing, about whatever other metabolic disease Absolutely. they're suffering from. Maybe they feel better and start moving around and. Yeah. Yeah. Blood, blood flow and things like that. So you're changing, you know, you ask what are the other things, like you're changing blood flow, you're changing neurotransmitter systems, you're lowering inflammation, and then the ketones uh, can activate gene pathways, we think, that can help increase cellular protection, right? So through histone deacetylase, it's activating things like superoxide dismutase, which protects the cells from oxidative stress or inflammation. Mm -hmm. So these are things too that, that we study, especially in the context of like oxygen toxicity, it's important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you elevate ketones, you see a proportional effect at lowering glucose. And we think that lowering of glucose is very important for some of the therapeutic effects we see. Definitely. What about, you had a great slide in your presentation of some of the known applications of nutritional mm -hmm. ketosis and then some of the emerging applications. Mm -hmm. And you've talked mm -hmm. about many of them already, but yeah. Can you fill in the gaps on what are some of the some things the that we ones. know that the science is pretty good at, at telling us that, mm -hmm. yes, this is a good idea. And then what are some of the things that are kind of on the new frontier? Sure. Uh, well, the things that have been around for a while are pretty much all seizure disorders. Mm -hmm. So a large majority of them, uh, and that would be like epilepsy. The etiology of epilepsy is largely unknown, but mm -hmm. like temporal lobe epilepsy, absence seizures, you know, uh, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, Dravet, Deuce syndrome. Uh, there's now Angelman syndrome. I had that in the emerging, but I would mm -hmm. kind of put that maybe in the uh, in the uh, solid, you know, evidence group. Uh, and then there's these neurometabolic genetic disorders like glucose transporter, pyruvate dehydrogenase, and then there's like a number, a, a whole bunch of rare neuro metabolic disorders that are very responsive to the ketogenic diet. It's actually the only thing we have for them mm -hmm. right now. There's scientists working on gene therapies, but in the meantime, you know, you're kind of keeping them alive and functional yeah, through the ketogenic like diet by virtue of elevating a metabolite that their brains can use for energy. When if pyruvate dehydrogenase is blocked, you know, mm -hmm. their brains can use ketones because you bypass that. Or if the glucose transporter is deficient, you're restoring energy through ketones. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so these things have been around for a while. The things that are kind of new are like weight loss and type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Verta Health is doing an mm -hmm. amazing job, uh, you know, spearheading a whole movement of using, of treating a dietary disease with mm -hmm. dietary therapy, yeah. really. I mean, you're treating carbohydrate uh, intolerance, you know, it, it's kind of silly to treat carbohydrate intolerance with carbohydrates, right? right? So you think about so why didn't we yeah. start doing this a long time ago, or maybe we did uh, and we got sidetracked, but yeah, it just makes sense. So I think that's, you know, a really big area of research right now that's gaining a lot of traction mm -hmm. where the ADA is actually starting to change guidelines. Uh, my student, as I had mentioned in my talk, uh, Andrew Kutnick, soon to be Dr. Andrew Kutnick, mm -hmm. is type 1 diabetic. And he has convinced me, even though I would say early on in my talks, if you're type 1 diabetes, you know, if you have that, don't consider this diet. Mm -hmm. Well, he came into my lab starting his PhD dissertation as a type 1 diabetic mm -hmm. and transitioned to lower carb and then in phases ketogenic. And I feel he's more productive and his wife would probably agree he's more safe mm -hmm. from hypoglycemic episodes if he stays in that mild state of ketosis. So that is something that, I mean, you could get in a lot of trouble years ago yeah. if, you, if you advocated <laughs> a, a low carb or even a ketogenic diet. But now research is validating that there's groups online mm -hmm. where people are using like very low carb diets yeah. to manage type 1 diabetes. And whenever you have less fluctuations in glucose, that's a good thing. And I think most doctors would have to agree ethically that if you're using less insulin to get better glucose numbers, like that's a double whammy of good. Right. Right. And you can't, if the patients did that and started doing that on their own, and their endocrinologist berates them for it, that's an unethical thing. I mean, the numbers tell the story, right? right. Especially if they're wearing a continuous glucose meter. Right. Like you can't argue with the data. That's, And they're, they're really, you know, if you have type 1 diabetes, it's really scary. I didn't even know. It was brought to my attention by my student, Andrew, that here are the 10 things you're most likely to die of. It increases your odds of of dying more likely to die from each one of these 10 things like it, you know from heart disease to cancer mm -hmm. but things you wouldn't think of like in an automobile accident you know oh, you have yeah. a hypoglycemic episode you're more likely to die like everything you went down the list so m simply managing your blood glucose from you know what he would show me before to after mm -hmm. like looking at those after numbers that's adding years to his life oh, yeah. if not a decade quality, to his life and sure, quality too. of life yeah so and medical costs down the road mm -hmm. so that was inspiring and i think that could be like almost like the next frontier and that's really like shoving it to, to in your face to like, right, right. the medical establishment <laughs> yeah. and especially the endocrinology and, and diabetes so that's really paradigm shifting Absolutely. so and then of course cancer too. And when I got into this, it was very little, it was a very controversial subject. Mm -hmm. And now we have over 30 registered, government registered clinical trials that are ongoing. And most of them are using the ketogenic diet as an adjuvant. Mm -hmm. And some maybe as sort of, you know, a pall palliative or mm -hmm. supportive care for advanced, you know, disease. But, uh, but it's really inspiring to see that work. Um, there's some evidence that other metabolic drugs like PI3 kinase inhibitors, mm -hmm. that their therapeutic function uh, kind of works optimally or only works in the context of insulin suppression through the ketogenic diet. So that's work by uh, Dr. Luke Cantley is doing some things and published on that. So uh, yeah, we're working with a number of different institutes mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, also, Alzheimer's disease is another, if you yeah. remember the slide, yeah, yeah. showing glucose, brain glucose hypometabolism is the hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Well, you have amyloid and tau plaques, of mm -hmm. course, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's kind of like a, like a downstream epiphenomenon of <laughs> impaired glucose right. metabolism. You know, when brain energy systems fail, you start the... The breakdown of these proteins and accumulation of these proteins happen, but I think it's neuroinflammation, 
glucose hypometabolism creating an environment where toxic proteins like amyloid uh, and tau do not get processed and do not get cleared and broken down. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the glymphatic system, which is activated during sleep at night, mm -hmm. is not effectively clearing these. So sleep is another thing. And we're looking at the effects of ketosis on sleep, sleep quality, sleep mm -hmm. duration. So that's another, I mean, yeah. I've had people tell me for years they had to take some medication to like sleep mm -hmm. or uh, to stay awake, modenafil or something mm -hmm. like that. And that like one patient uh, like got completely off of it with the ketogenic diet is now sleeping and feels That's better amazing. than ever. So I get these yeah. reports a lot. I don't know what to think about a lot of this, yeah. but once you get like, you start you to start get to more and more up. of it. Yeah. And then they send me papers. And I was like, okay, there is scientific rationale to what you're seeing. I yeah. mean, people send me disorders like, like Kabuki syndrome, mm -hmm. which is a genetic disorder. Like two doctors reached out to me and they just happen to be at the same institute. And now we're doing research on a genetic disorder and we're giving ketones as epigenetic therapy. Wow. Like I never could have thought like, <laughs> how, like you know, that that's completely mind blowing. Like years ago, yeah. I would have never thought we would be administering ketones, you know, in the, you know, for epigenetic therapy. And this mm -hmm. is work that came out of Johns Hopkins. So we have the Kabuki mouse model and prior work by Dr. Bjornsson. He's now in Iceland, but we're, we've continued on sort of mm -hmm. with those studies. So we went in directions that I never mm -hmm. could have thought. And even like the work we're doing in Na NASA, I yeah. would have never in a million years thought we would be, you know, doing that, doing these operational studies where we ourselves are crew members on the study. So, so it's cool. it's taken us, ketones have taken yeah. us in many directions <laughs> and I feel very fortunate and grateful for all the things. And it's brought me here to yeah. CrossFit. So. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, there's some effect of the ketones themselves and there's some effect of the insulin lowering properties yeah. mm -hmm. of being in nutritional ketosis. So I guess I, what I want to ask is for the average healthy person, generally healthy person, is there a, an additional advantage for them to be in a ketotic state versus just in a low carb diet where maybe they're not actually producing a lot of ketones? Mm -hmm. So I think for the normal, healthy, like CrossFit person, yeah. <laughs> uh, my belief is that, so I kind of stay in nutritional ketosis mm -hmm. all the time. I bounce in and out sometimes, but uh, it's rare that I get more than 50 grams of carbs a day, mm -hmm. but I'm not very active either, but I'm like a desk. I sit behind a desk a lot, but I work on a farm. So yeah. we own a farm and okay. I'm always doing like heavy farm work and stuff. So that's sort of my gym. Functional uh, fitness. <laughs> yeah. And I feel better. Uh, and I think most people will too. Like people that I talk to, even like guys like Rob Wolf mm -hmm. uh, has said and other guys that maybe their low gear is not as good, mm -hmm. you know, that drive yep. uh, in the beginning, but uh, but they're more lucid and they're more engaged and they can focus better on okay. a KJ. So I think intermittent ketosis, doing it through intermittent fasting mm -hmm. where you could do fast for 16 to 18 hours and then eat kind of whatever you want within reason. But if you eat low carb or even ketogenic, then you can kind of get the benefits mm -hmm. of that. You go into ketosis faster, get a little deeper doing the fasting mm -hmm. phase. Um, so I think that's one way to go about doing it or just periodically every, every once in a while, get your body into a state of ketosis and that accelerated fat burning and production of ketones will your body like you'll be changing things acutely obviously mm -hmm. but i believe that you're changing things you're activating genetic programs mm -hmm. you're to the extent where that if you go back to a regular diet and then go again to fasting or the ketogenic diet mm -hmm. it's like this metabolic memory that i talked yeah. about is that you your body knows what to do you enter that state faster you don't feel mm -hmm. sick when you enter the state you feel clarity mm -hmm. and the more you do it the easier it gets and the more benefits you derive from it over mm -hmm. time it's kind of it reminds me of a little bit of um like dr walter longo's work with the fast fasting yeah. mimicking and the periodic mm -hmm. like you don't yeah. maybe you don't do it for so long but if you do it periodically yeah, it's a good idea it yeah. kind of allows uh -huh. you to reset i i think that's a good approach i you know i don't know if that's optimal but yeah. what the way that is sort of pitched and the 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 accessibility that that has like it's a lot easier for some people to tell them you know, just don't eat, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, just eat within this defined window, this amount, and just have to do it, you know, five days a month, right. like instead of changing your whole Right. Part of it is how system. do you get the 
buy-in and the actual practical application yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. That's really true. Uh, but I am a, a big Whole Foods person mm-hmm. and I'm big on like we have, uh, I know there was some talked about chickens not being good or whatever, <laughs> yeah. but we have, I eat a lot of, my wife's Hungarian, so uh, she we have a lot of organ meat. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of liver, beef, and sardines. I love sardines. Yeah. And we have chickens too, okay. but we eat the eggs, right? Yeah. Eggs are yeah. good. And then chicken livers and hearts. We do a lot of chicken, yeah. and, which was a little weird for me to eat in the beginning. But yeah, that's a big staple in my mm. diet. Yeah. Which we also learned today, liver, right, was the most nutrient dense. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like almost- talked about today from Zoe's talk. Yeah, and vitamin A levels. Maybe mm-hmm. it could be toxic too if you eat <laughs> a lot of it. But I do try to eat liver like once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. And I think that I've been in situations where I've been sort of malnourished. I was doing fasting experiments mm-hmm. and I would have liver and then like my whole system, it's almost like a liver buzz. Wow. Like because it's so nutrient dense yeah. and maybe it was restoring either iron or B12 or something. Yeah. And I'm really kind of in tune with my body. And it's probably the only food that if I eat, if I'm in a calorie deficient phase or something where you can like feel the energetic effects of it. It's like, back. yeah. That's and very interesting. We haven't had gotten, I've had several talks in the last few weeks about liver and it, it seems like yeah. now it's something I need to start making. <laughs> with, with who? Like, Just ran. Well, so actually I heard Terry Walls speak uh-huh. a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was talking to Zoe, okay. hearing it again today. You know Paul um, Saladino? Do you know No, him? I haven't heard Yeah, of him. he just interviewed me for his podcast. Okay. And, you know, in, in preparation for his podcast, I started listening to some of his, his previous ones, and he eats raw liver. Oh, wow. So I haven't done that yet, but <laughs> uh, he's a medical doctor, mm-hmm. and he's really big, like conventionally trained, I think. And uh, I think he may be doing CrossFit and stuff, okay. too. He's a very fit, to very fit kind of buff guy. Uh, but he's super big on liver and eating it raw. I haven't done I haven't well, ate it I'm raw I'm going to start yet, with but, cooked first, and yeah, then we'll yeah, see yeah, how that goes. Cooked. Um, so are there any states, you mentioned at first you thought maybe type one diabetes would not be a good idea for ketosis, but are there any considerations that general people should have? Obviously you want to work with, if you're going to do this, maybe you want to work with your physician yeah, yeah, or yeah, a nutrition absolutely. expert, yeah. but, but where people should maybe be wary or maybe it's not a good idea yeah, to do yeah, ketosis. Absolutely. I think, uh, any kind of liver disorder, mm-hmm. like cirrhosis or things, or if your liver enzyme values mm-hmm. are off. So the liver makes ketones mm-hmm. and it does put some stress on the liver when you enter a mm-hmm. state of ketosis. Uh, pancreatitis, if you have like an inflamed pancreas, uh, any kind of pancreatic issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the past, kidney stones have been about five times higher in kids that did the ketogenic diet. But now a recent study when they use potassium citrate and they look at that, it's like a non-issue. Okay. So it was presumably the kids just weren't drinking enough because mm-hmm. your appetite is suppressed, but your drive to thirst is also yeah. lower too. So kids kind of run a little bit dehydrated. Uh, so I would say, you know, cautiously be cautious with kidney stones, any kind of liver function, pancreatic function. I think you should be, you know, very, very cautious Mm -hmm. when you do that. Um, and I can't think of like too many other, I mean, there's a number of different like fatty acid oxidation disorders. Mm-hmm. Like there's a kind whole, of rare conditions, but yeah, yeah, but you know, there's a spectrum for yeah. that and, but they are out there where mm-hmm. the ketogenic diet could be pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Like there are occasionally people will just have like a violent reaction to ketogenic diet. And mm-hmm. I think, well, maybe they have an underlying fatty acid ox. I mean, there's like yeah. 30 different enzymes and if you're, you may not be totally absent in one, but mildly deficient based on some SNP or something. And then mm-hmm. you just don't, it prevents you from fully adapting or even partially adapting mm-hmm. to a ketogenic diet or just a high fat diet. Yeah. And some people just have fat intolerance. Like they eat it, they get nauseous and they throw up mm-hmm. like, uh, but my body seems to like crave fat. Yeah. So, so I do a well on it. How about any differences between men and women? Cause I think, I don't know if this is more on, on a calorie restriction sort of effect or if it's the ketosis, but I've seen women where it's affecting like their menstrual cycle or it can yeah. have different hormonal effects. Yeah. So what I, I think there's a number of things going on there and that could very well be the case, but you have to look at a number of different things. Are they overtraining? Mm-hmm. Are they in a calorie deficit? Are, um, you know, I think those two things are important in assessing mm-hmm. those kind of claims that that's happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, but female physiology is very 
uh, reactive and responsive to low insulin and low glucose. Mm -hmm. So there could be a hormonal cascade that's kick, click, kicked on by hypoglycemia that wouldn't necessarily be as dramatic in males. Okay. And I think, I think it, it affects that hypothalamic pituitary axis mm -hmm. in ways that uh, I think males are more resilient when mm -hmm. it comes to fasting, carbohydrate restriction, mm -hmm. and female psychological behavior yeah. <laughs> in addition to physiological effects. Yeah. Uh, we, we've had some f females in the lab that attempted to fast and they like like fainted. Like oh, wow. they, uh, you know, you suppress hormone insulin, has a diuretic effect, mm -hmm. you hypovolemia and you get orthostatic hypotension mm -hmm. and then you just, in females, it could be a little bit more dramatic. Yeah. Like their response to that low, Definitely. low insulin, low glucose. So I think maybe they just need to be more cautious and allow more time for adaptation and, uh, and monitor. Yeah. I mean, these are things that we need to know because a lot of research, as you had mentioned before, I think that is done on males, mm -hmm. a lot of NIH sponsored research. So now we're looking at a balance of males and females. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, yeah, I think uh, my wife is very anti ketogenic. Mm -hmm. Like every she she tolerates carbohydrates and a large amount of carbohydrates very well. Mm -hmm. Where if I ate it, I would be especially at this because I'm fully like adapted to yeah. ketones now Good that idea. uh yeah I would be intolerant to it from yeah. a GI perspective and yeah. just from an overall feeling. For perspective sure. yeah but i think a good point to look at all those other factors so so many times you know like you said there's the sleep there's the how many calories are you eating how much are you training yeah. are you just under high stress situations all day long all of that is going to impact your hba axis and then if you yeah. throw the ketosis on there it might be like especially in females one extra thing that's yeah. kind of tipping you in the wrong direction yeah, so it's multifactorial. I think uh, it's important that if if a female is going to do it or anybody's going to do it, it might be good to go into the diet without being in a calorie deficit. So the situation usually presents itself. It's like when the female, <laughs> you know, starts the ketogenic diet, they start it during a weight loss mm. phase or something. So they go into it, and it's like a, a triple whammy, right? So they go into it. Over, you know, increasing the amount of exercise, decreasing the amount of calories, mm -hmm. and of course, cutting the carbohydrates. Yeah. So it's like you have all these three things working together, and your physiology is just reacting in That's ways such a good that. Point. Uh, one way to go about doing it is to transition to a ketogenic diet and maybe even do a surplus amount of calories, uh, do two or three days, mm -hmm. you know, so balance it out. Do like eucaloric or maybe mildly hypocaloric and then do a day or two or three in, in the beginning where there's some surplus amount of calories. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of resets your, your metabolism and then kind of ease into it in that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I haven't, I'm just speculating. Yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's still so much to learn. But I think the pro, it's, ad, it's really important to keep the protein sort of adequate and yes. maybe even high too, especially if you're an athlete. For sure. Yeah. So speaking of athletes, um, you talked a little bit about this today in one of the question and answer periods, but, you know, I think it's been well studied in more endurance athletes. We're talking, we're here at the CrossFit Games, we're the majority of people who are listening are people who are doing maybe one workout a day, but it's a high intensity workout. Is um, ketosis still a favorable sort of place to be to fuel that type of a lifestyle? It depends on the individual. Yeah. I think individuals that are at the top of their game are usually very carb tolerant, but that doesn't mean that it's optimal. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, my belief is that if you train in a mildly you know glycogen deficient phase then you're adapting your body for metabolic flexibility where you have greater access to your body's own fat stores but also burning the fat that you're eating in your diet too mm -hmm. and i think a higher fat diet lower carbohydrate diet you know normalizes and stabilizes insulin which gives you more steady fuel fl flow mm -hmm. throughout and during game time or go time you might want to titrate the carbohydrates back in during training train low train in a carbohydrate sort of low insulin state mm -hmm. and that will adapt your body to be metabolically flexible and then when you engage in competition and you want to experiment before you actually engage in competition, sure. you titrate the carbohydrates in a very 
calculated and strategic way and assess and basically use the carbohydrates or the glucose or glucose polymers or whatever mm -hmm. as a performance enhancing substance, mm -hmm. right? And kind so, of like you're supposed to do with caffeine, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually, the ketogenic community may cringe, but I think sugar is a performance enhancing yeah. like drug or substance. That and I think sense. it can be titrated back into the diet for athletes and it needs to be it doesn't need to be a lot and i think it can have neurological effects uh, but you may also want to eat a diet a low carbohydrate diet if you eat up to competition you can actually replenish and restore glycogen just by increasing your calories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you don't have to carb load right. prior to an event so if you're eating you know, even 50 grams of carbs a day or whatever on a low carb diet and you're a week away from competition, you just titrate the calories back in 25 to 30% calorie surplus mm -hmm. over, you know, four to five days. We'll do that. You back off on the calories a little bit and then get carbs back in around game time. I mean, these are all things after communicating with dozens, if not hundreds of athletes, you know, we've sort of worked out sort of, um, uh, sort of a general guidelines mm -hmm. that seem to be working. It makes sense from a physiological standpoint mm -hmm. and it seems to, you know, work mm -hmm. operationally even for <laughs> Yeah, even if we don't have Yeah. I'm not anti carb in any way, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm just I can appreciate the benefits of low carb and being metabolically adapted mm -hmm. and then reintroducing carbohydrates back in strategically. Uh, but really adapting your body mm -hmm. from a training phase, you know, to, to run off low carbs and then periodically putting in carbohydrates uh, when they can be advantageous. Yeah. And that, and it sounds like you came from more of a powerlifting background. Does the mm -hmm. same sort of thing apply for lifting? Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of thinking at it from that perspective mm -hmm. too. Um, you know, your powerlifting, at least the way I do, did it or, or occasionally do it is, uh, you know, the workouts are so short that mm -hmm. it's not going to really affect your deadlift mm -hmm. unless you're in there for hours on end. But my workouts from start to finish rarely go over like 35, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are a high volume, you know, if you're doing a high volume training over three or four hours, uh, I think it can affect your overall performance. Mm -hmm. You may lose some some gas in the tank towards sure. the end but even my uh good friend and, and colleague and so lane norton yeah. who's uh really into powerlifting and, and natural bodybuilder mm -hmm. uh he he is not an advocate of the ketogenic diet but he looks at it as a tool and toolbox and would probably even say the ketogenic diet is not optimal but it's not going to impair your performance okay. even for powerlifting in the context of powerlifting mm -hmm. Uh, and I believe it may aid in weight loss if you need to meet sort yeah. of, you know, if you're trying to compete in a certain weight class, mm -hmm. uh, I'm of the opinion that ketones are sort of anti-catabolic and that it may help that weight, help you meet that weight class requirement, mm -hmm. um, and more, less painfully, I guess, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of being starving all the time. Yeah. Yeah. What do we know about ketosis and the microbiome? You said this is something mm -hmm. that you're, you know, excited to be studying more, but yeah, I know at least from what I have seen, I know that it does it does make changes in the microbiome. But yeah. what do we know so far? Yeah, we don't know a lot. Mm -hmm. And if someone says they know, I would be skeptical. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a real. It's that's really a sign they they really don't know anything if mm -hmm. they say they know it's kind of like what they say in like first. quantum physics <laughs> right. you know if they say you know that means you really don't know <laughs> uh but we do know from the perspective of the anti-seizure effects mm -hmm. that there's two species that of of bacteria that seem to apply and one is parabacterioides okay. and another is acromensia mm -hmm. i don't know so well, there's two species that are impacted at least in rodent models, when they follow a ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. that they contribute to the neuroprotective anti-seizure effects. Uh, but you know, rodents aren't people. Right. So, uh, but I know there are probiotic companies probably jumping on the bandwagon now right. and like making for probiotic yeah. formulas <laughs> that will increase those species. Uh, hey, I mean, it's it's maybe worth a shot. But we do know, 
your gut microbiome is dependent on so many different factors, yeah. you know, and your geographical location, your gut bacteria eat what you eat. So your diet will impact the diversity mm -hmm. of the microbiome and the total amount. Uh, I think some of the comments I would say is that high carb diets increase small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, mm -hmm. like the SIBO thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when someone approached me like years ago, it's like, I had SIBO, like, what are you talking about? See, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. And I am convinced just by the volume of emails that I get that carbohydrate restriction and even, you know, intermittent fasting, like cures the SIBO thing mm -hmm. that was brought to my attention. And the more I look into it, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a very real thing yeah. and it affects many people in different yeah. ways. They get irritable bowel syndrome where they'll bloat up and low carb and intermittent fasting is sort of, mm -hmm. especially when it's combined together, yeah. is almost like a cure for that for many people. Yeah. So maybe it's just another symptom of excess carbohydrate in the diet that we're experiencing yeah. that all of these new fueling the nasty yes. bugs which can overproduce certain yeah. you know gases and then create a pro-inflammatory state that in affects the uh, tight junctions that hold the you know intestinal cells together and stuff too they are very those tight junctions and the integrity of the gastromucosal lining is very very sensitive and you know that's like your immune system about 70 mm -hmm. percent of your immune system is like in your gut mm -hmm. and if you permeabilize or in any way compromise that barrier to the environment it's like you know you are exposed to the environment your gut you yeah. are one you just have a hollow tube through you yeah and if those tight junctions are compromised or you have a leaky gut you are introducing you know uh stuff proteins you know chemicals mm -hmm. into your bloodstream and then your immune system becomes preoccupied dealing with that and that leaves you susceptible to infections mm -hmm. you know even things like like viruses that we have maybe like uh like herpes simplex or borrelia mm -hmm. or uh t gandhi i was reading about you know cat scratch fever mm -hmm. and things like i was reading about a, a whole bunch of different you know, bacteria and viruses that we harbor that our immune system keeps them at bay. Yeah. But if it's challenged in any way by physical or emotional stress, mm -hmm. these things can reactivate like things like shingles. And, oh, yeah. you know, I have had people contact me that had like shingles and they, their cure for shingles is just to start fasting as soon as they feel like uh, an episode coming mm -hmm. on and they have like certain things that will, you know, cue them in, then they fast and then it never, they never get like shingles, like stuff like it's this. Amazing. Like I never thought I'd be studying it. I was like, yeah, yeah someone needs to study that. And they tell me, oh, you need to study this because I've observed this. And I was like, it's great, but yeah. you know, it's good information, <laughs> but it makes sense, right? right? That, you know, you fast and then that's, that stimulates your immune system mm -hmm. and your immune system becomes more vigilant mm -hmm. at attacking bugs that would otherwise not, or viruses that would otherwise right. not have viral shedding or proliferation. Right. So, so fasting is a very elegant and very effective and we're you know evolutionarily hardwired yeah. for that to work and i think that's what crossfit is too right mm -hmm. i mean it's like it's elegant it's simplistic and it's effective mm -hmm. and like fasting or carbohydrate restriction is like the same thing and i think that's probably why it appeals to greg glassman i yeah. mean because it is just so elegant and simple exactly. and highly effective exactly it's going back to the basics yep um so i want to touch a little bit on cancer um, I had previously Dr. Seafried on the podcast yeah. and he talked in great detail about his research and I know you've worked with him yeah, he's a good extensively. Friend, yeah. Um, maybe for people who didn't catch that episode or who are not as familiar, could you give us a, just an overview of sort of the metabolic theory of cancer, the Warburg effect and mm -hmm. why ketosis may be helpful for preventing or treating cancer? Sure. Uh, I was turned on to Tom Seaford like 10 years ago mm -hmm. to explain some of the observations that we had in cancer cells. Mm -hmm. So the Warburg effect, if I could summarize it in a sentence, it would be damaged mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, which is how mitochondria make energy, mm -hmm. with compensatory fermentation right which is basically fermenting sugar mm -hmm. you create lactate and creates atp in a more inefficient manner but it can when you have damaged mitochondria you default to this more archaic you know form mm -hmm. of energy production so embryonic cells that are proliferating have very high rates of of glycolysis or substrate level phosphorylation 
Uh, but normal cells, normal healthy cells, they're not proliferating. And so they have, their energy system is mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Like 90% of their ATP is derived from mitochondrial function. So there are many things in the environment that can damage the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA. And that could be chemicals, inflammation, hypoxia, radiation, viruses. Mm -hmm. Viruses that cause cancer yeah. actually uh, are viruses that are more likely to attack the mitochondria. So progressive mitochondrial damage leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, and that leads to lower levels of ATP production. Mm -hmm. And the cell can sense an energetic crisis. The nucleus has sort of like these, there's energy sensing, you know, pathways, uh, that are basically that the the nucleus can sense the ATP levels in the total cell and also in the mitochondria. It's just this crosstalk mm -hmm. that occurs, and uh, and when the nucleus is sensing an energetic crisis, when the bioenergetic state of the cell becomes decreased, it kicks on a genetic program, uh, including the activation of oncogenes, and so it senses damage to the cell kicks on these oncogenes. Many of these oncogenes transition the cell's metabolic machinery. There's metabolic reprogramming from oxidative phosphorylation, which is good clean energy, to glycolytic you know, processes, including fermentation. Mm -hmm. So as that happens, there's a point and it varies between the organism and the cell type and the tissue type where that normal cell transitions to become a tumor cell that's metastatic and proliferative. If it activates, uh, if the mitochondrial damage is very extensive, it may trigger apoptosis and the cell dies. If the mitochondrial damage you know, occurs in a way that activates a genetic program that makes the cell resistant to apoptosis and basically it stimulates a whole cascade of genes that endows that cell with, uh, it makes it immortalized and basically stimulates all the processes that increase glycolysis, aerobic fermentation or aerobic glycolysis and proliferation. So all the characteristics associated with a tumor cell and including invasiveness and metastasis and immune uh, evasion and, and things like that and deregulated metabolism. So the metabolic theory of cancer posits that that enabling factor of a normal cell to a cancer cell is a result of a metabolic dysregulation and lower levels of ATP stimulate genomic instability because DNA repair processes in the nucleus are a highly ATP dependent process. So if energy levels fall, then the DNA in the nucleus cannot repair mm -hmm. itself and then you're kicking on oncogenes. So the metabolic mitochondrial impairment is the initial insult and that could occur from all those things I described from chemicals, a hypoxia, radiation, insulin resistance leads to inflammation, reactive oxygen mm -hmm. species, all these things. It's called the oncogenic paradox, mm -hmm. right? So all these things, multiple things can result in the same. And how does it do that? Because the DNA is complex. I mean, there's all these different, you know, uh, and different cancers result in different sort of uh, genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. But the it's important to acknowledge that the DNA of mitochondria do not have the immense repair processes that the nuclear DNA has. And uh, so mitochondrial damage is pretty easy to do and radiation studies kind of show that that's like a great model of producing carcinogenesis so uh so you know backing up a little bit mitochondrial damage uh metabolic derangement low atp triggers genomic instability triggers activation of oncogenes and that triggers a normal cell transitioning into a cancer cell mm -hmm. so the field right now it does not really believe that. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. field <laughs> believes that it's a genetic disease and what the mitochondrial theory of cancer, which Otto Warburg sort of 
advocated for and Tom Seaford sort of revitalized, mm-hmm. I think, and maybe a few other people, but Tom has been instrumental in spearheading this idea of cancer as a metabolic disease and did it in a very elegant way in his book, Cancer yeah. as a Metabolic Disease. Uh, there was a review written in 2010 that inspired me. And in uh, a few years ago, I wrote another review with Tom Seaford, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, Therapeutic Implications of uh, That. So we wrote a re- review. We've done like seven articles together, but that was one of them. Uh, so what does that mean? I mean, some people say, well, who cares how it starts, right. we know the Warburg effect does happen and there's this metabolic derangement. So let's let's worry about, you know, treating the cancer mm-hmm. and, and hitting these glycolytic pathways. But if the war if the cancer as a metabolic disease sort of theory is true, that has immense implications on how not how we treat the cancer, but how we prevent cancer. Mm-hmm. And preventing cancer is probably more important, right? right. I mean you know, you, you, uh, avoiding it is probably is the most important thing to do. And unfortunately, cancer research does not fund preventative studies. Right. <laughs> so we like need most to, things. hopefully, I mean, we, uh, I, I try to generate funds through, you know, uh, through various means mm-hmm. that are sort of, you know, alternative income mm-hmm. <laughs> things yeah. and, and putting my own personal income to solve some of these, uh, problems, which is not much. So I try to make headway when I can, but I think that's a really important question that we need to, to figure out is mm-hmm. that, uh, the implications of cancer as a metabolic disease are tremendous. And, you know, now top tier cancer researchers are targeting, uh, the, the basically developing drugs that target specific metabolic can- pathways in cancer, like mm-hmm. PI3 kinase inhibitors. Yeah. And they tend to work only in the context of a ketogenic diet with insulin suppression. So I think when I got into this, there was no cancer metabolism conferences. And now mm-hmm. there's about a half dozen. And these are kind of the same people who were like attacking Tom. I'm not going to name them by name, yeah. but they were attacking him as like some kind of flaky dude that didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And now, now you see an explosion of research on PubMed and even conferences on basically developing therapeutics to treat cancer as a metabolic disease. So it's kind of funny. (laughs) Yeah. So he has done a lot Mm -hmm. to the field and actually it's, it's it's paradigm. It's going to take a while. And I think, Tom and I don't agree completely 100% on everything, but we agree to disagree. But I think he's a very a vocal uh, critic of the standard of care, yeah. which includes radiation and chemotherapy. Definitely. But I think for liquid cancers, lymphoma, testicular cancer, and a few other like early stage cancers, it can be life saving. Mm-hmm. And I know that because I have family members and friends and people that I know mm-hmm. that did it, but they did it, you know. Uh, I advocate for them to use a ketogenic diet, if not ketogenic, then low carb. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've even had students with, you know, leukemia that Mm -hmm. went through therapy, but did a ketogenic, had absolutely no side effects and are doing remarkably well now. So on the therapy note, um, you and Dr. Seafree talk about this press pulse therapy. Can you talk about what's involved in that? Sure. Uh, So the press pulse therapy is sort of, the idea behind that is not that you go in with like a flamethrower and a knife and try to eradicate the cancer and <laughs> that you have a more gentle approach and we call it metabolic management of cancer. Okay. So you cr- first thing you do is create an environment uh, that stops or slows cancer growth. So one way to do that is to get your body into the metabolic state of therapeutic ketosis, which is lowering blood glucose and elevating ketones. And we use a biomarker that Tom actually developed in his lab called the glucose ketone index. Mm -hmm. So if your glucose is three, if you can get it down that low and your ketones are three, we call that a glucose ketone index of one. Mm -hmm. And experimentally, if you can achieve that, that level of insulin suppression, reduced glucose availability, and perhaps the therapeutic effects of ketones, at the very least, slow cancer growth. So you can do that. You can use a drug like metformin and you could do like exercise mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, meditation and things like mm-hmm. that from a psychological perspective. These things can help at the very least slow 
slow down cancer and then make it a vulnerable target for the pulse therapies. And the pulse therapies could be, uh, I'm an advocate of using the standard of care when it works. Mm -hmm. So that's chemo, radiation, and in some cases, immune-based therapies, mm -hmm. right? And then we study hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Mm -hmm. So if you increase, if you reverse tumor hypoxia by saturating the tumor with high levels of oxygen, that actually creates an environment. So uh, the, the PO2 of the tumor, so radiation works better if there's oxygen in the tumor, mm -hmm. right? So the efficacy of radiation therapy is proportional to the PO2 of the tumor. So if you hyper oxygenate the tumor or make it less hypoxic, and you do that an hour or two before radiation therapy, you're not only generating reactive oxygen species in the tumor, you're increasing oxygen, which is a substrate that radiation is basically working on to create the oxidative burst that kills the tumor. So radiation, you know, we're taught that radiation damages DNA and that's how it kills cells. Yeah. Uh, but that's only about 20% of the damage that radiation cause is actually from damaging DNA. So okay. it creates uh, reactive oxygen species, about 80% of that, and those reactive oxygen species. So this is like well known, but maybe, I mean, it's well known, scientifically proven. Like mm -hmm. what I just said is a fact, yeah. but I don't think a lot of people understand that. So you really need to increase oxygen. That's the important thing. And tumors are resistant to radiation because they're hypoxic. Mm -hmm. And if it's hypoxic and you're blasting it with radiation, it's not going to do much because you're not, you don't have the substrate to create the reactive oxygen species. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the context, we think of IV vitamin C. Mm -hmm. So IV vitamin C does not work well on its own. Don't, you know, Mexico clinics tell you it works and all these things, mm -hmm. but don't believe that. IV vitamin C, it does work pretty well. Uh, it can enhance chemotherapy. And we believe that in the context of metabolic therapy and hyperbaric oxygen, that the IV vitamin C drives fentanyl chemistry to cause a pro-oxidant effect that in a non-toxic way can enhance other therapies. Mm -hmm. But it does not work good you know, by itself, but it can enhance other modalities and it's doing it in a non-toxic way. So we, we like IV vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Oral vitamin C doesn't, you can't get to the concentrations. Concentration. You need to use it sort of as a drug. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing would be metabolic drugs, including things like 2-deoxyglucose, 3-bromopyruvate, you know, metformin, I talked about that, that can be used continuously, mm -hmm. but there's other drugs coming online that are very powerful and have very serious side effects, but they can be used ideally in a press pulse fashion mm -hmm. where you have this continuous press where you're compromising the tumor, you know, growth and proliferation mm -hmm. and metabolism, and then you hit it you know, with three weeks on, three weeks off of like 2-deoxyglucose, okay. which we know inhibits glycolytic processes. If you inhibit tumor glycolysis, you're impacting like the pentose phosphate pathway, which endows the cancer cells to produce glutathione. So you're crippling its antioxidant effects, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so there's, there's very sort of mechanistic sort of rippling effects when you inhibit glycolysis. It's not only targeting like tumor energy, it's targeting like tumor and endogenous antioxidant pathways, tumor signaling, like mm -hmm. insulin signaling, things like that. So we, we think like in the future, you could develop a, and I just mentioned a few things, but there's like a, actually a big expanding toolbox that this idea of not trying to eradicate the tumor, when people have a tumor in their body, they just think of it as like an alien. They right. want to cut it out, slash it, burn it, it with yeah. radiation. But, uh, but it's likely that like people like you and I can have tumors and they might come and go. Yeah. And it's like, uh, we're cancering all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like a process. It's like a verb, right? Yeah. We have mutations and our body corrects them and things like that. So we want to keep our immune systems healthy. We want to keep our mitochondria healthy. If our mitochondria are healthy, the our genomic stability, the fidelity of our nuclear genome will be enhanced by enhancing the mitochondria's ability to make energy. Mm -hmm. So that may sound like a stress, but or like a stretch, but like, you know, ketogenic periodic ketosis, intermittent fasting, exercise, probably the biggest, fresh air, you know, healthy relationships, things like right. that, like stuff that we really need to advocate for will keep the organism in a healthy state where the malady of, you know, cancer will not occur mm -hmm. or will suppress it. And then some people are just unfortunate. They are genetically sort of hardwired mm -hmm. 
to get these mutations and to get cancers. And there's certain cancers that, uh, but only a minority, maybe seven, maybe 10% of cancers are like really somatically driven from somatic mutation. There's still so much that we can do, like you said. Epigenetically, mm -hmm. we can, uh, you Reduce know, really impact the expression or uh, suppression mm -hmm. of genes associated with cancer. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's fascinating. Um, so I want to start wrapping up, but I am curious about your self experimentation because mm -hmm. I know you mentioned you kind of got into this in high school because you were mainly interested in your own kind of performance with football. Yeah. And I know you said you've even done experiments as part of your formal research where you've been experimenting mm -hmm. on yourself. And then I think I've heard that you do some <laughs> self experimentation outside of that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering your kind of what drives you to do those things and if there's been anything interesting that you've learned yeah. by doing this on yourself that then has you've taken back into your, your research yeah I, th I think it's important for I, I think you're much more engaged in the actual research mm -hmm. if you are tinkering and experimenting on yourself mm -hmm. and I I honestly I don't know why other people don't do this right <laughs> I know the, the first talk I gave I won't say where it was at but it was a conventional you know, neurology conference mm -hmm. about epilepsy. And I mentioned, you know, and I do the ketogenic diet and, mm -hmm. and people are like, whoa. And oh. then after, after that, it was like, oh, we didn't know you had epilepsy. And it's like, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, no, no, I just do it because, you know, I'm, I'm researching it and I want to get a feel for yeah. what foods I can eat and things like that. And they just thought that was bizarre. And this is like, you know, 10 years ago. Right. So uh, fast forward now, keto is all the rage. Everybody's doing keto, right. but it was before no, that. But it gives me really good insight into what, I'm, I'm all about, our lab is very focused on doing the basic science research, clinical and operational stuff mm -hmm. from military. How can we, we are convinced of the benefits for many different things. You know, it's not done a cure all for everything, mm -hmm. but it's a very, very powerful hammer for so many things. So from my perspective, if I can make this accessible and readily implementable yeah. and, and, you know, make it easier for people to implement that may be doing more good than even the basic science tinkering stuff we're doing in the lab. So I am highly motivated to do that. And maybe even there's a little bit because I want to personally feel better and like enhance my, yeah. but I, uh, so what I will do is, you know, see it, see how low I can get my glucose levels down mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll tinker with that and get it into ranges that should be putting me into a coma. But, you know, I did early studies where supplemental ketones kept me alive and functioning and, you know, uh, so these are some of the are early studies of fasting like in your basement or like with, I don't uh, know, like with someone around in case something yeah, happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do it. Like everything's kind of very, uh, structured. Well, like uh, I go to yeah. this level. Okay. I'm okay. Go to this level, you know, document it mm -hmm. from a metabolite point of view. Yeah. But that has, you know, I talked about the Cahill studies yeah. where they fasted subjects for 40 mm -hmm. days, injected them with insulin, dropped their glucose down to like 20 milligrams per deciliter, one millimolar mm -hmm. lower. So I became curious because I had tools at my disposal yeah. that I could sort of do that, but even make it safer because I had exogenous ketones, mm -hmm. which they didn't have back then. Mm -hmm. And I could do it in a very incremental way, not infuse insulin in me. You know, I could, you know, there, there's different ways to do it. So I, I experimented in ways that validated to me that ketones could be life-saving in the context of, for example, insulin shock yeah. or, you know, uh, fatal hypoglycemia. Like, like the, this is like really important for people to know this and like, there's no publications on it. Yeah, like in theory, you would look at the data, oh, that should work, but they didn't have exogenous ketones. But now we do have these tools and they mm -hmm. could be saving lives in the clinic. So, uh, and I know of some studies that are actually funded, you know, starting now. And, and in a f couple years, what I'm telling you will probably be published and that could revolutionize the way we treat people. So, uh, but I needed to validate it on myself. It was kind of interesting to me. So, uh, and I did things like fasting for like seven days mm -hmm. and I lived a lifestyle where I was force feeding myself six meals a day for like probably more than a decade and maintaining, you know, my body weight to like 240, 250, just because I wanted to be as like big and strong as possible. So mm -hmm. fasting was so contradictory to what I used to do. I used to get like, I remember having nightmares about like missing a meal. Oh my God. <laughs> like I'm in lo some location. It's like, Oh, when did I eat last? Yeah. Oh my God. I have no food for the next, <laughs> I got to get home 
tomorrow, but I have no three. Right. Like things, I used to panic about it. Right. So for me, it was kind of liberating that once you're in ketosis, you're not that hungry. And then in the context of elevated ketones, they're sort of anti-catabolic. And I talked about that a little bit. And it was, it was, it liberated me from food. But when I, I like to enjoy food, I think food should be, I don't think we should deprive ourselves of food. So depriving myself of carbohydrates, that's not something that I miss. Mm -hmm. So, and if people really miss that and enjoy that, I don't think they should eliminate it from their menu Mm -hmm. or their meals. Like, uh, I think we need to enjoy food. That that's part of the process, but I enjoy food much more if I'm a little bit hungry, Mm -hmm. I appreciate the food. I enjoy it. Ketogenic food is like indulgent to me because Mm -hmm. for years that's the stuff I avoided. So I'm Mm -hmm. still, I'm more happy with my food now than I ever was, I think. And I don't, I don't have like irrational food behavior Mm -hmm. where I just eat until I get sick. Mm -hmm. Like I don't do that anymore. I think I used to do that in the past with carbs or like a bowl of cereal or something. I would eat and I would literally be full, but I would still eating. like be hungry and right. keep eating for some reason. It, it was like make Zoe, I think, talking about that carb-fat combo. We can just keep eating it forever. Yeah. 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 I can't imagine ever being like that because, I mean, I think I just rewired my brain. Like I don't have that hedonic sort of instinctive drive to just eat as much of that those cookies or chocolate cakes it's just like nauseating looking at it you know (laughs) it's crazy how quickly you can shift your brain over yeah yeah and Uh, maybe you know you're younger if i'm in my teens and i'm growing and i'm my output is high mm -hmm. my food cravings or my psychological effects but i think my relationship with food has changed dramatically Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's that's a beneficial thing. And I could see like people who have like psychological issues with food, mm-hmm. like going low carb and then adapting your body to that over time, I think will really serve them well. Oh, I think it'll absolutely. improve their relationship with food. So that's absolutely. a whole nother topic. But it is. Yeah. I don't but study it, but I just, but I can just tell it myself. Yeah. Oh yeah. I can tell it myself too. Or, or mm-hmm. whenever I go through periods where I start eating just like more carbs, just kind of sneak back into the diet. You mm-hmm. just, it's like you're, you're you can't think clearly about food anymore. It's yeah, like yeah. you all of a sudden are having your brain hijacked with these cravings. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So I finish with three questions with every guest. So my first question is, um, what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and it, none of it will be diet. So okay. I think, yeah. Awesome. So Even better. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the biggest thing is like getting out in nature. Yes. So what I do is we have a farm, a 77 acre like hobby wow. farm. This is in, but in Florida? In Florida. That's yeah. Amazing. So we're like new sort of farm owners. So we're putting the fence in now. We're getting cows. That'll be, you know, completely like grass fed. And we got wow. chickens and things like that. But we have two rescue dogs. So in the morning, I generally like wake up and sometimes it might not even be light, but uh I take the dogs and I get that sunlight. As soon as the sun gets mm-hmm. above the tree line, like we go walking around the fields. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had like zucchini and other things growing up. And we just, we get out and we just do like, it's even a 20 or 30 minute walk. And it was hard for me to do it first because in the morning, that's when I'm in the zone to write yeah. and get like my work stuff done to take, to break away from that and to get out there and walk. And that kind of resets the clock and kind of gets the clock and the circadian going. Mm-hmm. So that's like really important, but, uh, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, and just creative downtime. Mm-hmm. So schedule that in. If, if I don't schedule it in, then it doesn't happen. And, uh, and that affects my psychological health. Yeah. I think that uh, must be really challenging with all the different demands that you have on your time. How do you protect yeah. that? Uh, well, I have to actually have to like schedule it in like 30 minutes of doing something creative. Mm -hmm. That's not like filling out admin paperwork Mm -hmm. for a grant or something like that or or writing. So, or just emails and emails can kind of be creative, your responses, but it's really like 30 minutes of just kind of brainstorming, Mm -hmm. writing in my notebook, uh, journaling Mm -hmm. or something like that or just thinking of new ways. Mm-hmm. Like I'm in kind of in this trend of sustainable farming. So I'm mm-hmm. always writing about different strategies so for that. Uh, so that, and then, yeah, I mean, I just guess just like being with my wife, like not thinking or doing about anything and then reserving time. Like she's really my priority. Mm-hmm. So I just, uh, and sometimes like, you know, I have to just kind of give in to what she wants to do, mm-hmm. you know, and just be like, clear my plate. Okay. You want to, 
uh, go dancing or study this or watch this. And it's like, yeah, I'm just completely committed to just being in the moment. And that, awesome. yeah, I think, yeah, that's about, that's like the three, that's like the important stuff. Like relationships are yeah. super important, like sun and being outdoors. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, food is sort of like that peripheral thing, but that's just, I don't have to think about that. That's automatic. That. Yeah. What the second question is one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it. So I am like a spiritual person, mm -hmm. but implementing spirituality is, is kind of hard for me. So like meditation yeah. is one. And I downloaded a meditative app. Uh, I guess maybe I can mention it. Sam Harris is waking up yeah. like it's guided meditation. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was beneficial, but I just cannot stick to it like meditation is kind of hard especially mm -hmm. guided so i think i want to i know that's beneficial yeah. and i know that could be part of my creative downtime or something so i want to invest a little more time into doing that but i generally like read things that are more spiritual so i engage in kind of the literature on that yeah. but when it comes to like spiritual you're not going to get it by reading to be you right. know to really change your spirit you have to it's experiential right, right. so uh, I'm trying to figure out a way there's so, we have so many things going on right now. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to just clear my mind to be, to have that spiritual mindset. Mm -hmm. So I need to invest more time into that. I think definitely yeah. we can always do more. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> have you ever, have you ever tried heart math? As a, I have not tried it. Yeah. But, but it's I heard, an interesting, yeah. I don't know. I've been as wanting far as meditation to. apps go. Yeah because it does give you that feedback. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Yep. I see some people have more success with that, especially if they're, they need kind of that validation of, am I doing this right? Funny you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. That's like on, maybe even on the list of things that I put a star next mm -hmm. to that I got to try this. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. And they've got tons of research. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question is what does a healthy yeah. life look like to you? Well, it's all what we're striving for balance, right? Yeah. So I think balance is really important. Um, on the top of that, thing so there's like if there's like a trinity right mm -hmm. so it's like move your body which crossfit is a big advocate of uh fuel your body properly mm -hmm. with the right types of fuel right and then i would say sort of spirituality relationships but that's like in one category so like nutrition exercise stuff that we've been taught but very specific and then uh relationships mm -hmm. or and and spirituality too which is like part of that could be like a personal thing but um because i said trinity i gotta clump <laughs> that into one so yeah so that's uh but i i do think that like spirituality it's like part of it's internal but it's also the relationship you have with other people yeah. and how you you know and that relationship is sort of the experience of you know you have to kind of you live it through yourself mm -hmm. uh so for me that could be and there's different like for my students like my students are unique i feel like i have a personal relationship mm -hmm. with them i try to be friends with them and then of course my family but my wife you know being at the top of that chain mm -hmm. um but and then your circle of people can grow too much and then you start to get diluted and then you yeah. start to reduce the amount of time where you should be prioritizing to the key people in your life so being able to you know my i say my circle is always like open it's like a c mm -hmm. and it's always adding people <laughs> but i need to you know trim away the people like sometimes people come into your life and you they serve a certain function you to them and them to you yeah. but sometimes you have to let go to let new people in yeah. and do that but That's you don't okay want your circle to get too out. wide right. because you have to keep the main thing the main thing which is you know allocating time for your immediate loved ones and you know your wife and your family and things yeah. like that. So I need, I kind of, I don't really struggle with that, but I need to remind myself yeah. of that all the time. Yeah. So. I think we all do. It's a good practice yeah. to go through. Just, am I really spending the time, the places that I want to? Yeah. I think I need to self analyze because I just engage. And sometimes I'm just like in a reactive mm -hmm. mindset, like I gotta do this and that, mm -hmm. but I need to take a step back and be more reflective. And then, uh, and I think journaling really helps mm -hmm. like I have sort of a, Tim Ferriss got me started on like the five minute gratitude yeah, journal. Cause yeah. I journaled like all, and then I just, it somehow I stopped doing it when things got real hectic and now I'm getting back to it. And I think that's really important too, to just reflect, mm -hmm. you know, on your life and the things that are important. 
once you journal it, it kind of makes it happen. Writing it you down. Know, you got to write it helps. down. Yeah, definitely. Well, this has been amazing. Hmm. Where you. can people find you if they're interested in learning more about your research or things you're doing? Uh, I tell them to go to keto nutrition dot org dot okay. org. And uh, we have a blog and we have consulting information about, uh, we have podcasts on there, things mm -hmm. like that. I'll put this podcast on awesome. there. I'm excited to do that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's kind of like a one-stop shop. And we're constantly like working on that too. And my assistant, Christy, you know, yeah, is yeah. helping to build that out. Uh, so yeah, I guess that and... Yeah, that's a, yeah, just go there. The best starting <laughs> yeah, place. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you again for sitting down with me. Thank you again for being here at the health conference and love being here. Yeah. yeah. We Madison's really, great. It like is. Madison's, I mean, the weather really helps too. It's like low humidity, 75. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Better than Florida this time <laughs> yeah. of year. But yeah, we come, we've been doing it as our vacation week every year. We just come and hang out for the whole week. Wow. So great idea. Yeah. yeah. Very, Very good. Cool. Well, thank well, you thank again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. And this we look amazing forward platform. to following all of your research and seeing how things evolve. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Hey there. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. Nutritional ketosis is a topic that I know is talked about and experimented with so much these days. So I was really excited to go straight to the source with Dom in this conversation and learn about his cutting edge research in the field. Here are some of my biggest takeaways from our conversation. Number one was that ketosis isn't necessarily for everyone or for all the time. So whether you have a medical reason or you just really love carbohydrates, a ketogenic diet is just one tool in the nutritional toolbox. I really liked how Dom talked about the importance of enjoying food and not having a negative relationship with food as very important things to consider. Ketosis is also something that can be dialed on and off in a way that fits your unique situation, so it's always important to work with a healthcare provider that can help to tailor it for you. My second takeaway was about nutritional ketosis for high-level athletes. So from my personal experience, I used to think that nutritional ketosis would not be very beneficial for high-level athletes, especially those who are required to have high power output like CrossFit athletes. But after this conversation, I'm thinking about things a little bit differently, and I'm very curious about what we'll learn in the coming years. There's still so much that we have to learn, but I wonder if there are ways that ketosis could be used strategically to optimize performance, even for someone like a CrossFit Games athlete. My third takeaway was about the importance of self-experimentation. So we touched briefly on how Dom has experimented on himself and how this informs his understanding of what he's studying in the lab. I also like how he talked about how he feels really great when he's in ketosis, and he discovered this through his own trial and error. And I think to some degree, self-experimentation is so important for all of us, and it's necessary in order, to divide, in order to identify what works best based on our own individuality. So I hope you guys had some good takeaways yourself from this conversation. Thanks again so much for tuning in. To make sure you never miss an episode and to receive exclusive content from me, head to my website, juliefouché.com and subscribe to my email list. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and consider giving the podcast a five-star rating on iTunes. Also, don't forget to share your stories. If you or someone you know has used lifestyle to overcome a serious health challenge, please send me an email at info at juliefouché.com. I'll choose some of these inspiring stories to share here on future episodes. Don't forget you can train with me through Beyond the Whiteboard by visiting trainwithjuliefouché.com. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time on Pursuing Health.